Okay, everyone, let's move on now to um, to um, the most common type of reactions we see in um, an aqueous solution, and that is called um, double replacement reactions. So that's one of the type of reactions we'll talk about today. Um, so if you took intro chem or you remember in high school, you should have known um, something called metathesis reactions or double replacement, double displacement. Uh, essentially, you have two compounds um, that um, are soluble in water. Well, yeah, so usually they are soluble in water. And then a chemical reaction occurs where they produce a insoluble precipitate or a gas that is not that will just um, escape solution. So um, we'll talk about that um, in a little bit. But first, let's let's first talk about electrolytes. Okay, so solutes that dissolve in water um, they form an aqueous solution. They fall under three categories. Strong electrolytes, solutes that break up almost completely into ions when they dissolve. As we see here, sodium chloride, when we add it to water, it will dissolve into a uh, sodium ion and chloride ion. So even though you know there's strong there's strong interaction energy between sodium and chloride in the solid, um, that interaction energy can be uh, can be broken down if water surrounds each of those ions. So the energy from hydration of these ions is equal to the energy that holds the solid structure together and that that is what allows the solid to be soluble in solution because of the favorable interactions with water. So you're not able to do this type of kind of um, form solutions with nonpolar compounds. So um, this will not happen for um, for um, compounds that are not soluble in water, for example, you can't you can't dissolve sodium chloride in something nonpolar, like um, diethyl ether, um, hexane. So organic solvents typically don't dissolve um, um, ionic compounds, but um, polar organic solvents they can dissolve them to a certain extent. Okay, so strong electrolytes usually water they'll dissolve completely um, in solution. And that's how we, um, that's, that's another way how we can generate electricity. Okay, let's move on here. Non-electrolytes, they don't break up into ions when they dissolve. They, um, um, they, they simply remain as ions. So some examples are sucrose, glucose, F1 glycol, methanol, ethanol. So uh, for example, this sucrose right here, it would dissolve in water. We see here that it becomes the aqueous state and that no ions form. So these are examples of non-electrolytes. And these, um, these cannot be used to charge batteries. They can't be used to carry charge throughout a um, throughout a system, so they are, they are called non-electrolytes because they cannot conduct electricity in solution. Okay, lastly we have weak electrolytes. So right here my example is silver chloride. So you see the two arrows um, between the reactants and the products. That means that silver chloride um, is in equilibrium with, the, with its ions. So what that means is that only partial part um, only some part of the silver chloride salt um, dissolves or dissociates into ions in solution so we call this a weak electrolyte because it won't generate as much electricity in solution um, as something like sodium chloride would but it still can um, it still can um, conduct electricity but to a minor a very small extent so we call those weak electrolytes so um, some more examples of these are um, you have strong um, strong electrolytes strong acids strong bases they're good electrolytes and then when you have weak acids or weak bases they fall under um, silver chloride so for example we can also have sodium hydroxide HCl HNO3, H2SO4. So those are the most common ones. Okay, so strong acids, strong bases. So this would be a base, 
and these all are acids. Strong acids, strong base, strong electrolytes. Um, examples of weak electrolytes um, here would be something like HF, weak acid, acetic acid, um, C2, H3, O2, um, O2. Um, and then some weak bases like um, like ammonium bases like NH3. So weak acids or weak bases, they are also known as weak electrolytes. Okay, so now let's um, move on here. Okay, so one way to detect ions in solution um, is to test its conductance or conductivity. So we look at this conductivity apparatus on the right here. You see there are two, um, there are two electrodes in solution and then... Um, once the ions form a solution, they can uh, transfer electric charge in the form of electrons, and um, and that can um, create a circuit between the two poles in solution, and that will um, cause a flow of electrons to flow through the circuit, and that will light the light bulb through the wires there. So the wires are connected to electrodes. Electrodes are in contact with ions moving in solution, where then electrons will be polarized to one of the electrodes and they'll cycle through and light the light bulb. Oops. Okay. So for the light bulb to light, the ions in solution have to move and carry the charge between two wires, right? Completing the circuit. So what happens is, is that um, <clears throat> as these ions are forming, electrons are going to go to the anion and that anion is going to get in contact with the electrodes and when it does that, it will transfer the electric charge and enable to complete the circuit. And that will keep flowing through and keep the formation of ions in solution and the flow of electric charge. All right. Strong electrolytes will make the light bulb glow. Let's see. Will we think more brightly, less brightly, or not at all? So when we have really strong electrolytes, they'll, they'll make the light bulb glow pretty, pretty bright, brightly. So it will be very strongly um, bright. So more brightly here. Non-electrolytes, however, don't have any ions at all, so you wouldn't see any um, any um, generation of electricity. So not at all. Okay. And then weak electrolytes um, will make the light bulb glow. Um, so weak electrolytes, they only have partial ions, so it'll, it'll probably be very dim. So it will make the light bulb glow less brightly because there's not as much um, electric charge or ions moving in solution. So we say less brightly in this case. Okay. All right. So that's how we detect ions and the difference between strong, weak, and non-electrolytes. Okay. So now let's talk about solubility rules. So for the solubility rules, I will provide a very abbreviated um, summary of this. So for um, studying purposes, um, it's in everyone's best interest if you kind of know the rules, but you don't have to like memorize them per se. Um, like I won't ask like, oh, which which category of these are soluble, but you'll have to be able to use this these rules to predict products and tell me which one which product is insoluble and which one which ones are soluble. Um, and that comes um, later when we talk about writing the net ionic equation. So you'll have to be able to recall these rules and apply them. But um, I don't like to strictly make students memorize them but um for writing net ionic equations there's really no other way um but i'll try to maybe um try to to quite make questions um um that don't explicitly ask you to memorize the rules but um to get in the hang of these solubility rules i would um um, 
do more problems. So um, in discussion, we will go over this. And then um, in the homework, and also there's also book problems that um, will ask you to write these solid, um, to write the net ionic equations. And by doing more practice with that, you'll learn like which ones are soluble, which compounds are soluble, and which ones are not. Okay, so this is one of the more tricky parts of Gen Chem is like memorizing all these things um, for these double displacement reactions. Okay, so just as a summary, the alkali metals are pretty much all soluble. There's no exceptions. Nitrite, nitrates are all soluble. Nitrite ions, so like sodium nitrite, copper nitrite, iron nitrite, silver nitrite, all soluble. Um, so pretty much any salt of uh, carboxylic acids, they're really soluble. So sodium acetate and potassium acetate. Um, the only exception to that is silver acetate. Um, chloride, bromide, the halogen um, salts are usually um, soluble, except when they're paired with copper, um, sorry, um, sorry, um, so co like things like copper, sodium, uh, potassium, rubidium, soluble. The only ones that are not soluble are copper bromide, copper one bromide, um, lead, um, so how, how, um, uh, halogens, um, halide ions, well, lead ions, so lead, mercury, um, mercury, um, one ions, silver ions, and copper one ions. And we see there copper bromide as an example of copper one. Okay? So they're usually soluble, but there are some exceptions with silver, copper one. Um, usually I just say silver, lead, and mercury. Um, copper one is that weird, ex weird exception there. Okay, sulfate compounds, they are typically soluble. Some examples are sodium magnesium sulfate. Um, the exceptions are the rest of the alkaline earth metals. So barium, strontium, and then um, like before, lead compounds, silver, calcium, and silver one. Um, so barium and strontium and lead and uh, And I think that's it. They're unsoluble. Silver, calcium, and silver one, they're slightly soluble. But um, if I were to ask you about this, I'd probably give you something like barium sulfate and strontium sulfate. Or lead sulfate. Okay? Alright. Sulfides are generally insoluble. Exceptions are copper, iron, and cadmium, which are kind of a random bunch. So, um, oh, sorry. I keep getting these mixed up. The examples of the insoluble ones are copper, iron, and cadmium. Sorry about that. The exceptions are alkaline, are um, sodium, potassium, ammonium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, and barium. So pretty much the alkaline, alkali and alkaline earth metals are the exceptions. Those are soluble. Um, oxides are generally insoluble. Some except some examples are silver oxide and copper oxide, and then some exceptions are the alkaline alkali and alkaline earth metals: sodium, potassium, strontium, barium. Um, calcium is um, the odd one out. It's slightly soluble. Hydroxides are usually insoluble. Some examples are iron iron two hydroxide, beryllium hydroxide, nickel two oxide. Um, and then the, um, the ones that are soluble are the strong acids and ba the strong bases, sorry, strong bases, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, strontium, and barium. They're soluble. Uh, again, calcium is, is slightly soluble. So anyway, calcium, you could think, okay, maybe it's slightly soluble. We've seen that a lot um, in this discussion here. Okay. Chromate, so um, another thing I want to talk about is ammoniums. Ammonium compounds are usually all soluble. I didn't, I didn't think I specified that here. But ammonium ions, so ammonium chloride, ammonium bromide, ammonium hydroxide, usually all ammonium salts are, um, are soluble. Okay, so hydroxides, not soluble. Chromates, phosphates, and carbonates are generally insoluble. Some examples are magnesium phosphate, um, Cobalt 2 phosphate. Yeah, cobalt 2 phosphate. 
um, strontium carbonate and zinc chromate. So the exceptions of, to these are compounds with sodium, potassium, and ammonium ions, and such as sodium chromate, potassium phosphate, and ammonium carbonate. Okay, so those are, those are the solubility rules. So we're going to put this into practice and see um, how we can apply this. Okay, so but let's share, let's talk about the um, what what does it mean to be soluble and insoluble? Okay, so here's this kind of um, scale here. So if you dump in a, a a solid into solution, if only enough solid, um, if to be soluble, you need to the compound needs to dissolve. To give a concentration of at least 0.1 molar, so that's pretty much um, 0.1 mole, right? At least 0.1 mole. That's soluble. Insoluble is when um, the concentration of the sake was. Uh, so if you have a saturated solution, um, so typically some solids they won't dissolve. Um, they'll dissolve until a point where they reach saturation. And that means enough solid is in there that no more water molecules can, um, can surround the ions, thus no more can dissolve. So what insoluble means is that you reach a point where you're saturated and the concentration is less than 0.001 molar. So that's less than 0.001 mole. So that's very small. And that's the case with silver chloride, which is not soluble in water. So we call that insoluble. But it does dissolve to an extent. So every solid does have some solubility. But we generally classify it as insoluble because the amount that dissolves is um, very, very small. Okay? Slightly soluble is our compounds that give solutions that fall in between the extremes. So between 0.001 and between 0.1 molar. So something that's 0.01 molar in solution, that will be something that's slightly soluble, like calcium sulfate. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, I think um, we'll go, oh, so let's go over writing net ionic equations and then we'll spend the next video um, doing some examples. And then um, if there's time left over, we will do more, um, we will do more practice with writing net ionic equations because we do need a lot of practice to get the hang of this. Okay, so net ionic equations. A net ionic equations, uh, it basically tells us to it allows us to condense the reactant, the reaction, um, in a uh, in a double replacement reaction, and we can ignore the non-reacting spectator ions. So it allows us to say, okay, these these two speed these two ions here don't do anything, so we can simply ignore them from the equation because they're not reacting; they're not part of the reaction. So if we take the condensed equation, we can say, oh, okay, let's remove this and this, and now we know, now we're left with what's actually happening in the reaction, making it more clear and un undeniable what kind of reaction is occurring, okay? So let's just um, go over how we do that. So, so you could write net ionic equations for double replacement or single replacement. Um, single replacement is another name for oxidation reduction reactions. Um, and we'll talk more about that, I think, next week. All right, so here's our condensed. So usually we have a situation where AC and BD are, two, are soluble in solution. But when, they are, when their solutions are combined, they will produce a, what we call a precipitate. So this is a precipitate. So precipitate is, um, in this case, we're not referring to rainfall. Um, we're referring to a a deposit or a, a solid uh, a um, a product that's in a different phase than um, than in solution. Okay, so usually you have something that forms a solid or precipitate in solution. We usually refer that to as a solid. Now, some reactions will give off gases, but we usually don't call that a precipitate because precipitate uh, usually refers to a deposit or solid. So in this case, a precipitate 
is our solid. So that's our indication of a positive reaction, okay? So if there's no precipitate forming, there's no reaction because nothing's happening, right? Because they're both still soluble. So it, we just say, oh, everything's soluble in solution. So this is an indication of a positive reaction. So something happened, okay? So say we have our condensed equation here, barium chloride plus sodium sulfate, um, that gives us barium, uh, sorry, sodium sulfate to give us barium sulfate and sodium chloride. So let's just write these name out um, for practice, barium, because who knows, you know, nomenclature was on the quiz, on the first quiz, so no, nomenclature may be on the, the first exam. So barium chloride, sodium sulfate. So I would study these, um, especially the sulfate ion, because a lot of students um, have trouble remembering sulfate and sulfite. But to their credit, I know it's a lot to remember. All right, barium sulfate and then sodium chloride. But this is just scratching the surface of all of chemistry. Um, but if you do pursue chemistry, um, the nomenclature, uh, it gets almost impossible to name things sometimes. So, but the basic things we should know because we need to know how to refer to chemicals by their names. So, um, more complex chemicals, they have really long names. No need to remember those because they are usually made from the simpler chemicals. So we should know the simpler, the simpler names of the chemicals because those are what we commonly use to make more complex ones. Okay. So the total ionic equation is where we, we say, okay, are they soluble ions or are they not soluble ions? If they're soluble ions, you write them out as their ions, aqueous, and they're not soluble, you keep them together like barium sulfate solid, okay? So, so if it says aqueous, so here's, here's something to keep in mind. Even though it says aqueous next to its name, that does not mean it's completely soluble. For example, acetic acid, is not will not completely dissociate or separate to H plus and acetate ion. It'll stay as mainly acetic acid, and that's because it's um, a weak electrolyte. So you could write out the ions like this in your aqueous forms only if they're strong electrolytes, and they're strong electrolytes if they're soluble in water completely, not not partially soluble. So barium chloride. So just let's go back to our solubility rules here. This is how you would use this table. All right, barium, so let's see, chloride salts. So it's this table, the fourth table here. The fourth table here, okay? So chloride, bromide, and iodide salts are usually soluble, and the exceptions, there's no barium in the exceptions, right? So it's soluble. So barium, barium will turn to barium two plus, and two um, plus two Cl minus. So we need to put a two there because there's two in the chemical formula for barium chloride. All right, let's go to sulfates. Sodium sulfate, so we see here, uh, sulfates are usually soluble and here are some examples and we see here there are no trace, there's no, um, um, there's no sodium sulfate in this list. So we can conclude it is soluble. And it says right here, it's soluble, right here. Sodium sulfate. So sodium sulfate will turn into two Na plus because there's two sodium ions, and then sulfate is SO4 two minus. So we will leave sodium sulfate like that. Okay. So this equate uh, this this turns out to be a long chemical reaction. I mean a, a long uh, form. Uh, it it takes a lot of space to write the complete. Um, ionic equation, so usually you may want to put the arrow on the second line. All right, barium sulfate. Now, if we go to up to the sulfates again, we see here that barium is in the exception list, and that means it's not soluble, right? Because we said sulfates are usually soluble. If there's an exception, that means it's not soluble. So barium will not be soluble, so we leave barium um, intact. Do not split it up in any means. All right, barium sulfate. And then we all know sodium chloride, table sugar, uh, not table sugar, table salt, 
very soluble. And if we go up here, we can con confirm that right here that um, the chloride ions are usually soluble. Here are some examples. And we see sodium is not present is in the exception list. So sodium chloride is soluble in water. And we kind of probably all knew that from growing up or from learning about this in our earlier days. So sodium chloride soluble. So we write that as two sodium and two chlorine right here. Okay. So um, how do we get to the net ionic equation? Well, um, since we have what we call ions on both sides of the equation, um, and um, ions that are in the, the same kind of ions and the same number of those kinds of ions on both sides of the equation, we can do like what we do in math, cancel them out from both sides, like we do in a math uh, uh, algebraic equation, right? So there's two chlorine molecules here. We can cross that out. Two chlorides, two chlorides. The chlorine, the chloride ions are not doing anything in the reaction. And then we can cross out two sodiums, two sodiums. Okay. So we can't cross out sulfate or barium because there's not a sulfate ion or a barium ion on the product side. They combine to give us barium sulfate. So that is our net ionic equation right here. So see, the net ionic equation tells us what kind of reaction is happening. Now, now the product is no longer free barium 2 plus ion and sulfate 2, sulfate 2 minus ion. It's the compound barium sulfate where there are not ions in solution. And it's a precipitate and, that's, and that's, that is what forms. Okay, so um, now that we've gone over these, uh, how to get the net ionic equation, we're going to do two examples in the next video. Okay, so see you then.